construction part three today's topic is new construction for commercial and non-residential hello i'm olivia rios director of operations and programs at the la latino chamber and we want to thank you in advance for being with us today we have so much information for you that we want to get started right away but first of all we'd like to thank our sponsor southern california edison for their continued support of our programming and providing um, technical training and resources to our Latino community. Today's panel of experts will be sharing information on new services, charge ready medium duty incentives, and cannabis energy codes for 2023. A few housekeeping notes please mute yourself and be respectful of others. Ask questions in the chat box, and at the end, we will have a QA. Once again, the session is being recorded and will be available later this week on our website. But first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, our chairman, Daryl Salceda, who's been in the construction company most of his life and is the CA COO of Associated Construction Services and also Ruby Rose Yepes, new construction senior advisor at Southern California Edison. Mr. Chairman, welcome. Well, good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's bundled up. It's a little, a little brisk out there this morning. Um, and um, thank you so much for attending um, our much needed um, information on, on new construction. So our moderator will be Ruby Rose Yepes and um, take it away, Rosie. Rosie. Daryl. Rosie Rose, all right. <laughs> Ruby Rose. <laughs> It's okay. Ruby Rose. As long as you don't call me Rudy, I will take everything else. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's Wednesday. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us on this uh, commercial-focused commercial, commercial -focused workshop. Ooh, I think I need my coffee, too. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Ruby Rose Yepes. I am a senior advisor here with Southern California Edison, supporting all of our new construction customers, both on the residential and the commercial side. Um, we've had uh, three workshops. This is the third one. And um, I know we've been uh, putting out a lot of content and information. So feel free to reach out to us if you have any follow up, um, if we don't answer any of your questions at the end. Um, our agenda for today is um, we're going to do a quick intro and a safety moment. Then I'm going to hand it on over to my peer, Jose Luis Gomez Jr., who is one of our planners, who's going to speak about service planning. Then we're going to hand it over to Ramiro Lipe, who's going to talk about our charge ready transport program. Then one of our um, peers, Tina with Wilden, is going to speak about the CETA program. And then lastly, I'm going to just tap on some really quick highlights on some energy code updates that will be implemented on January 1st that are directly impacting our um, controlled environmental horticulture uh, buildings. And then we'll have final thoughts and questions with Ms. Olivia. Uh, just some quick housekeeping. As Olivia did mention, this uh, workshop is being recorded. And if you do have any questions uh, while we're presenting, just feel free to drop your questions into the chat and we will answer them after each segment. Um, and then we'll have some more Q&A at the end as well. And at Edison, safety is one of our most important values. And so given it's the holidays, just wanted to cover a few safety items. Um, if you are like me, you're going to have a bunch of candles in your house. So just please remember to keep a radius of uh, around the candle, if it's going to be lit, um, of 12 inches uh, of nothing that can be, of nothing that is flammable. Um, also, if you have a tree, make sure that you're watering it consistently, especially if it has the lights where that can um, dry it up a little bit quicker, or if it's by actually a vent. So if you're heating your house um, and if you have air blowing on the tree as well, uh, make sure you put a little extra of the water and tree food that does really help as well. Um, and uh, also, if you have the lights up, just make sure that you're not overextending the amount of lights uh, strings uh, that you're attaching together because that could cause a short on your electrical system and you don't want that to happen. And um, lastly, if you do have any of those small electric heaters, also keep them away from anything that can be flammable. And so with that, I am now going to pass it over to Jose. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Jose Gomez. I'm a local planner out of the Monrovia Service Center, and uh, I'll be covering the uh, planning process for commercial projects here. Um, so SE system planning process, uh, we perform annual evaluations to address the changing power needs throughout our territory. Um, system capacity plans are, are set up uh, 
and a 10 year forecast. And this is all depending on information that we received from customers and other uh, load forecasting methodologies. Um, it's important for us to get accurate and timely customer information um, so we could design, uh, design the system. Uh, your best option is to contact SE as early as possible in your planning process. And that we could just dis, uh, discuss what uh, uh, your power needs are and how we'll be able to provide it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the current challenges that we're facing uh, is that as the industry continues to electrify, um, we're going to be building new facilities, and we are seeing an increase in the number of requests from customers looking to uh, for electrical capacity. Um, actually, if we could go back one slide, I believe. Thank you. Um, grid updates are sometimes needed to create capacity sufficient to accommodate power service needs. Uh, the Metro East region has been seeing a number of growing uh, residential growth. Um, and that also requires great infrastructure. And then the commercial tied in with that as well. Um, so SC is a public utility and we are regulated by the California Public Utility Commission. Uh, we are responsible for uh, being prudent with the expenditure of customer funds and then constructing infrastructure, infrastructure upgrades where load does not materialize. It could harm customers in the form of rate increases. Um, as a regulated utility, um, Edison must show sufficient, with sufficient confidence that the upgrades are required. Uh, with that, when we're looking at the, um, the load that's being proposed by a new commercial project, uh, we have what we call a level of confidence. Uh, so submitting your documents early, to talking about the amount of load you're going to be using, um, and then a, a proposed schedule of when you need this load by, uh, will give us a good idea to present to engineering. And then with engineering's assistance, we can uh, uh, decide if we have as part of the infrastructure is enough that you're going to need, or if we're going to have to do upgrades on our system to be able to provide that power. Um, depending on the magnitude of the load, uh, we may have to, mission has to be involved as well. Uh, and, in some cases, we have to approve part of your load now and then give you a date of when we'll be able to do the rest of it. Now, if we may do the next slide, please. So when to contact SE regarding your power needs? Uh, the short answer is as soon as possible. Uh, if we can plan uh, plan our system around, uh, around the time that you're starting to do your plans, uh, we can start making decisions that will help with um, placement of structures, uh, pole replacements, if we're gonna have to extend <clears throat> a pole line into your property. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So long, in short, um, SC will always provide power. Um, we are in the business of providing power to our customers, um, but the grid, the grid may require upgrades. Uh, customers should contact SC as early as possible for large power requests. And then you contact the appropriate planning department uh, to discuss and review the scope of your project, uh, including pl uh, plans for phasing in the power. Next slide, please. So the, the typical local planning process project will want to uh, start a new service. Do so by either going to this website, uh, sd.com slash planning. Uh, you can also call in to the uh, residential co commercial de uh, department. Uh, phone number for the commercial line is 1-800-970-788. And then you could also contact the local service center. Uh, from there, you can tell them what city you're gonna be constructing in and they'll refer you to the local planner that covers that city. Uh, once the service request is initiated, uh, the typical uh, planning and design process uh, involves the planner just uh, describing a list of documents that we're gonna need from, from you as a customer um, before we can get started on the project. Uh, some of these include like a customer project information sheet, applicant design option, site map, electrical plan, uh, grading and elevation plans. Um, and the local planner will be able to kind of uh, design the, or give you a, the appropriate list for your specific project. 
once we receive that full sub, uh, full design submittal, then we can start doing the preliminary design. Uh, once that preliminary design is complete, uh, we'll send it over to you as a customer. You'll review and approve. And once we receive that approval, we can move towards a final. Um, a final design will, will cover whether we have to involve uh, environmental review, permitting, uh, whether it's through city, uh, Caltrans, US forestry, and then uh, once we get a final approved work order map, uh, we'll give you a list of tasks that needs to be completed in order for us to energize. And also uh, the invoice will come your way as well. Um, we'll then handle bills and contracts during the construction period. Um, and then once all the tasks are met, um, all the contracts and, uh, and invoices are cleared and inspections have been received, then we can move on to scheduling. Uh, scheduling will, uh, will involve a pre-construction inspector to check conduits and structures, and then also city inspection to release on the electrical panel. Um, so after we receive all completed tasks uh, and we submit to scheduling, scheduling typically takes about four to six weeks. Um, and then the next slide, please. And then this is a... a, a a large view, step-by-step um, step of everything that happens at each phase. So in step one, it's the uh, customer information package phase. Step two, we design. Step three, customer requirements. And step four, we move on to scheduling. And step five is actual construction and final accounting. Um, overall, the process could take about uh, four to six months if, if the power is readily available. Um, if new infrastructure has to be put in, um, it could take up to two years. So again, the, the importance of involving uh, local planning as early as possible, uh, I, I can't stress that enough. Um, and then the, the planner will be able to meet with you either outside or virtually to, uh, to discuss the details of your project and give you the best uh, uh, timeline of what you're gonna, what you should be expecting. And, that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jose. Um, <clears throat> does anybody have any questions uh, <clears throat> that they would like covered right now? You know what, let me talk about yeah, I have a question, Jose. What, yes. What takes, what takes so long to get a project up and running? I'm getting ready to develop some infill area and um, we're gonna need power rent to the, to the, to the, to the, to the lot. And you're saying it's going to take two years to get power there? Up to two years to get power to, to my lot? Thank you. Uh, so it, it potentially could be up to two years if we don't have any existing infrastructure. And by that, I mean, like, if at the lot have uh, any structures or poles that have power there now, yeah. uh, getting power from the nearest block or neighborhood over to yours, it could mean have new poles on the street, uh, new vaults, and that process could take up to two years. But let's say I had a, a project where it's an empty lot, and across the street or on the same side of the street, there's a vault or there's a pole. That's where we start looking more of the uh, four to six month time range. Okay. I have plenty of poles around this facility. It's in between some other apartment buildings. I was just thinking, holy smokes, like oh, I'm going to go out of business. I start <laughs> building them. <laughs> All right. That, thank you. To huh? that point, Daryl. Um, yeah. So I've been doing a lot of work in supporting some of the cities that are having significant growth, like Adelanto, where they're just yeah. mean California City, um, where the yeah. the load has been very minimal for the last few decades, and then all of a sudden, I'm going to say primarily because of cannabis, their uh, load growth has grown significantly because of businesses coming in, and so it's typically rural areas like that. Um, that have a longer lead time because there's distribution and potentially transmission projects that have to happen in order to bring um, capacity to the area. But if you are building um, within an existing developed area, 
typically the power will be there, but <clears throat> one of the things that can be done is uh, the study, the engineering study, which will help to identify what is the current load um, in and not the current load, but what's the current capacity in the area. And, um, and then that will give you guidance on is, is there a, you know, a lengthy timeline in order to bring power to your project or is the power already existing there? And that's why it's also really important that as soon as you start thinking about your project, right. contact Edison, get on our radar so that we know that you guys are looking to bring a project in that space and we can start, um, we can start not fully planning for it because there's some limitations, like it has to be a really valid a project that's moving forward, but at least it gets on our radar and we have it, you know, on, on our, on our list of projects that could potentially be coming up and plan for it. As, as, as uh, Jose had mentioned, our fo forecasting is about four years out. So that's, that's the most important thing that I can say is reach out as soon as possible. To your territory, does it, where, where does it stop at? Does it stop like in um, the Inland Empire area? And particularly I'm talking about, there's going to be a lot of housing development in the Imperial Valley, but I think that's IID, right? Yes, or, so Imperial Valley is, is a different uh, utility, right. um, but uh, San Bernardino, Riverside County, all, all the way to the Nevada border, Arizona border, yes. we go all the way out there. Okay. Um, other than the Imperial area. Thank you. Of course. Um, all right, if there's no other questions, then we are now going to jump to, and if you do have any additional questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and we can always come back to them. Um, all right, next is uh, Ramiro with our Charge Ready Transport Program. Buenos dias, buenos dias. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, guys, for having me here today. I'm super excited to share our Charge Ready Transport Program with all you guys. But first and foremost, let me just tell you guys, it absolutely means everything to me that you guys are here spending your, what is this, Wednesday morning with us. My main mission today is to deliver world-class customer service and give you a framework for infrastructure installation success with all things charge-ready transport. So, Ruby, you can please go to the next slide. All right, one more. Thank you so much. A little bit about me and what I do and what I've done. So I actually come from the transportation industry. That is my claim to fame here at Edison. So I have represented numerous companies uh, selling forklifts, selling commercial cranes, renting, leasing, financing, and also running a rental division for a large commercial class two through eight uh, dealer. So that was a lo whole lot of fun and a lot of vocational. So in other words, I understand a lot of the transitions that are happening in the industry, and I bring that knowledge here to Edison today, which, of course, I want to bring to you guys. So you might be wondering, what is charge-ready transport? So in short, charge-ready transports are low to no-cost EV infrastructure installation program that has tons of bells and whistles, which we'll go over today. But essentially, this is, this is for you if you are a real estate developer, if you're a property manager, you're a fleet owner, a fleet operator, or you're leasing to somebody that falls into that category. And ultimately, anybody that has an interest in deploying class two through eight electric vehicles in our service area, this program is for you, potentially. Now, regardless of what service area you are in, there is a couple of tips that I have of how you could achieve a high uh, you know, electrification future, right? So we always talk about utility and fleet engagement. So a lot of times you'll hear utilities say, engage with us often, engage with us early, but what really does that mean? And these are just five tips for you, regardless of what service area you are in, that you should utilize if you are looking at deploying commercial assets uh, at any point, given point that are electric. So the first one is EV adoption. Now, a lot of people attend webinars like today, they take tons of notes, but then take no action. My recommendation is always, if you are bound by any of the impending regulations, you definitely wanna start on a short-term scale, get a test fleet going, test two, three, four, five assets, see how they do for your particular fleet. And then once you get that proven framework, then you wanna scale that forward. Another great tip would be that you could also look at the successful deployments within your industry. Transit agencies, school districts are really famous for doing this where they do a lot of knowledge sharing. Learn from other people that have already been where you're at and then follow that framework as you're moving forward. The next one would be determine appropriate EVs. So this would be future proofing and right sizing your infrastructure as well as your EV deployment, right? So you wanna look at the actual electric vehicle itself, the battery size, the charging scenario, your charging patterns, topography, all these items play a factor into how you wanna spec your vehicles, your infrastructure and your charging station. So we talked a little bit about right sizing and future proofing your infrastructure. So that a question I always have for people is, 
you know, yes, your initial deployment, what does that look like, right? What are you doing the next two to three years? You know, it might be you're, uh, you know, adopting three to four service vehicles, or maybe they're tandem axle day cabs, or it might be a bus. But what does that plan look like over the next 10 years? To Jose's earlier point, you want to definitely let us know as soon as possible what your plans are. So we sent you, we could phase in the power and meet you at your phase of demand. The biggest one is also contacting your local utility company and establishing the proper rates. This I get a lot, right? And I, I get questions like this all the time. Like, can I just hook up my EVs to my current infrastructure, right? My building can handle it. Yes, you can not technically do that. But what's going to happen is your electric bill might be ridiculous once you get it, right? So through our programs, we offer special commercial time of use rates as well as demand towards holidays. You want to set up your rate structure up front with your local utility. That way you can set yourself up for infrastructure success over the long range. And the other one is also timing. So I can tell you guys, it does take anywhere between a year to year and a half, usually between applying for any utility-led program to the time that the infrastructure is physically in the ground. So the worst case scenario, right, is that you get your truck, your charger, and then your infrastructure is nowhere in sight, right? You definitely want to do it the completely opposite way where you're getting your infrastructure pulled in first, then the truck, then, excuse me, then the charger, then your vehicle, and then all is good. So those are just five tips regardless of what service area you are in. But Ruby, if you could please go to the next slide. If you happen to be in Southern California Edison service area, this might be a program for you if you are looking to give, uh, electrify your fleet. So charge ready transport. So what is it? So a little history lesson about the program itself. It is a five-year program that launched in 2019. And what the California Public Utilities Commission did is they gave us a budget of just over $342 million. The entire goal of that budget is to electrify a total of 870 sites for a total of 8,490 electric vehicles. So yes, as you can imagine, we definitely have our work cut out for us. Now, there's four main aspects that make up charge-ready transport. And the first one, the one that we're mostly known for, is that we actually give a customer two infrastructure installation tracks. On both of those tracks, we would actually do all the Edison site upgrades that are necessary to support that deployment. And then we give a customer the option where we go all the way out to the electrical stub out or that first point of interconnection between the charger and the physical infrastructure on their side of the facility. And then there's another option that we offer. So if the customer is looking to add any kind of what we call distributed energy resources, such as solar, energy storage, microgrids, for example, there's a secondary track that does support that, that has up to an 80% project cost rebate associated with it. And of course, I'll go into massive detail here in a second in regards to both of those options. We do also offer charger hardware rebates of up to 50%. And I'll show you guys a qualification and kind of a sneak peek. They do range between 1700 all the way up to 37,000 per physical charger. So definitely a great incentive. And then we also offer commercial time of use rates. So the, the, your project would actually have a whole new meter with special EV rates designed specifically for your EV initiative, as well as demand charge holidays. So we'll cover that in a second. And I brought a special guest on with me that nobody knew about, so surprise. And uh, Luis will be talking to us a little bit about our EV advisory services, which are our grant writing assistance and EV readiness study. So Ruby, you can please go to the next slide. All right, so what kind of charges do we support through Charge Ready Transport? So you guys might have heard presentations or seen presentations of our Charge Ready Light Duty, which is everything that is just a commercial you know, passenger vehicle. We do also, on this side of it, we support everything from an AC level two charger all the way up to a 350 kilowatt DC power cabinet. So AC level two, think like a F-150 Lightning, for example, DC power cabinet, that'd be for more of a transit bus or a day cab, for example, that's running multiple shifts, kind of give you an idea. Any charge that you pick that goes to our charge ready transport program does have to be an approved product list. What ends up happening is we check to make sure it is UL certified and also NRTL certified as well. So it goes to rigorous lab testing to make sure that it's safe and uh, for use in public charging. All right, maybe you can please go to the next slide. All right, so some of the good stuff. The charger harbor rebates of up to 50%. So how do you qualify for this you know, rebate of 1,700 up to 37,000 per physical charger? There's three main ways of how you can do that. So the first would be if your entity is a transit agency or if you're a school district, you will automatically qualify. Or if your project site is located in a disadvantaged community by way of air quality and your organization or parent company thereof is not on the Fortune 1000 list. That would be the requirement for you to be able to actually qualify for the up to $37,000 per physical charger. Now, if you look here on the right, it is based on the power band. So zero to 19.2 kilowatts, for example, that'd be up to 50% rebate, uh, up to 1,700. And then if you're doing anything that's over 150 kilowatts, that's 37,000 per physical charger on that realm. Now, one question I get asked a lot is, is this program stackable? 
I can tell you there are other programs that are non SCE that mesh really, really well with our charge rate transfer program and these incentives. And that would be programs like CalSTAR Energize or even their HVIP program. You could always utilize outside programs through this particular, you know, uh, charge rate transfer program, as long as the outside entity is okay with you utilizing charge rate transfer. So that's another added bonus. All right, we could go to the next slide. All right, so for the actual infrastructure build out. So we talked a little bit about what we do to support the infrastructure build out at your facility. So here, this happens to be our SC built infrastructure option. In this scenario, we're gonna cover everything that you see in green. That includes upgrading or replacing a transformer if necessary, running service to a brand new meter with special EV rates and demand charge holidays. That line right down the middle that represents your property line. And what's really unique about the program is that we will actually come onto your side of the meter. And then at that point, install the paneling, all the switch here, run all the conduits, all the wiring, all the way out to the electrical stub out of that force point of interconnection between the charger and the physical infrastructure itself. Now, what's great about this program, the customer here would only be responsible for the electric vehicle, the charging station, installation of the charging station. We cover everything else. So that would include planning, permitting, getting design work, uh, you know, going out to the local area, having jurisdiction and getting all the permits and plans taken care of for you. You know, design work, you know, all that is inclusive of the charge ready transfer program. Ruby, if you could please go to the next slide. All right, so the secondary option would be the customer built infrastructure option. And here we're still gonna cover everything that you see in green with the distinct difference that everything in gold would be responsibility of the customer. Now, if you happen to go in this direction, it's because you either wanna install solar, energy storage, uh, you know, do a microgrid scenario, or you want some advanced bells and whistles to your particular infrastructure. Now, if you decided to go in this route, we would cover up to 80% of the project cost for you going in this direction. And that is not inclusive of any kind of a solar or any project that's over what we would have done under our SCE built, make ready, uh, you know, point of work. And I can tell you one thing, there is, uh, in this scenario, you would have to utilize an IEBW unit labor in order to construct a project on the customer side of the meter. Now, this program does have easements that are required as part of the program. So, there, you know, if you notice, for example, we do go up into the first point of interconnection or up into the meter and panel, depending on which infrastructure option you utilize. So it is something where if you are interested in this program, I can certainly send you a copy of the sample easements up front. That way you can send those to legal and get them reviewed, you know, before we proceed with anything. All right, Ruby, you can please go to the next slide. One back. There we go. All right. So there are no demand charges through the end of 2023 through this program. And then there's a phasing period of from 2024 through 2029 that are you know eligible as this program. Now we are currently enrolling individuals that utilize charge rate transfer into commercial time of use seven, eight, and nine. So if you look here at this graph, it's indicative as to charging patterns, right? So one thing I highly recommend fleets to do is make sure that you are looking at your fleet utilization and start implementing managed charging as a possible solution. So here in the scenario, for example, if your fleet operators come in, let's say at six o'clock in the afternoon, you can literally set your charges so it starts charging after 901. So that way you're avoiding that higher peak you know, time frame where you're gonna get charged more for your electricity consumption. So something for you guys to consider. We do have a free tool that would estimate the cost of electricity versus that of diesel. And that is our fleet fuel calculator.sce.com. Highly recommend it. Free tool for instant access. You go in there, put all the specifics of your fleet and it'll actually tell you exactly what that cost savings might be. All right, you can please go to the next slide review. All right, so I wanna bring on Luis Torrico. He's actually represents our transportation and electrification advisory service to talk about these two a la carte services that we offer. Take it away, Luis. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Thank you, Ramiro. Uh, you may be looking at this slides, uh, charge rate transport. You may think this is for you. You want to electrify your fleet. You may be Googling online uh, how to electrify your fleet, and they may be overwhelming. Well, these two programs that we offer are very helpful for those people that have no idea where to take the first step. Uh, when talk about the EV rating studies first, EV rating studies is for fleets that are looking to electrify in the next two years and they don't know where to start. What we'll do is we'll do a full study on their fleet and site um, and we'll it'll be tailored on the customer application. We'll look into vehicle availability. Uh, we'll look into diesel versus electricity, our charging level recommendation, financial incentives, managed charging recommendations, preliminary site planning considerations, and most important, the next steps. What will be your next steps? Um, customers that will qualify are customers that have less than 50 vehicles 
in our SE area. And our next program will be our uh, uh, grant writing assistance program. So we have partnered with GNA. Uh, and if you're looking into grants to help you with uh, electric vehicles, we will write a grant on your behalf, ask for all the paperwork as needed. And uh, the grants that we're currently working on is car Moyer and VW mitigation, and they do require scrapping. So if you're looking to upgrade two of your vehicles that you are re ready to let go and scrape, then we can help you with those grants. Uh, those are two programs on no cost for our SE customers. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Luis. Now, I guess you might be wondering what kind of vehicles are eligible for charge ready transfer, right? You heard all these great stuff that we do, but so what kind of vehicles are you procuring in order to have that? So in this scenario, it does cover any type of on-road vehicle that is a class two all the way up to class eight. So think F-150 Lightning, you know, tandem max of day cab is what you see here in the picture, a bus, a, you know, refuse vehicle, anything that's 100% electric at 6,001 pounds and above. If you are running, uh, you know, any kind of off-road vehicles such as yard trucks, forklifts, maybe you have TRU or transport refrigeration infrastructure that you need some, you know, shore power support, any kind of airport ground support equipment, really anything that's 100% electric to include tractors and bobcats, for example, as long as they are 100% electric and off-road, they would also qualify for this program. Now, guys, what's really unique about this program is that we can look up to your 10-year deployment strategy as an option. So meaning, for example, if you tell us today that you want to deploy a total of 100 day caps over the next 10 years, right, a 10, a pop for the next 10 years, we can technically deploy the entire infrastructure up front as part of this program. So essentially, all that you would have to do in that scenario is purchase and install the charges up front as part of the process. And then you will schedule those vehicles onto your program participation agreement. Now, I know buying chargers 10 years in advance makes absolutely no sense. So you can customize that number. So you might say, well, 10 years doesn't make sense, but we could do a three-year strategy or four-year strategy or five-year strategy. And in that case, it will prevent you from being in a perpetual construction project. Another option would be that you could apply to charge ready transport numerous times in the same facility. We don't give you any caps on that. So you can start with your test fleet today and then you know, a year from now, two years from now, whatever makes sense for you guys, then that's when we could actually you know, finish off, you know, the, get you guys another application into our program. All right, review, please go to the next slide. Couple more down, we, we wanna go to terms and conditions, please. Ah, right there, uh, we'll go one back uh, to, there we go, real 29. All right, guys, so Charge Ready Transport does have a, a vehicle acquisition required uh, requirement as part of the program. So for every one vehicle that you purchase, you are allowed to install one port. Now, in some scenarios right now in the industry, we're seeing a lot of public charging or charging as a service, uh, you know, different types of initiatives that are going out into the industry. So for something like that, we do have another program that's called Rule 29. So think of Rule 29 as just utility side upgrades uh, versus where on the charge ready transport, we would do utility side upgrades and then potentially rebates or up to the you know up to the stub out on the customer side. Char you know the infrastructure rule for Rule 29 would be just utility side upgrades only. At that point, there is no requirement for vehicle purchases. So if you are looking at developing the site, you don't plan on you know buying any vehicles per se, then Rule 29 might be an option. There's tons of stuff that goes into it. We could definitely have a you know offline conversation in regards to either of these two programs if you guys are interested. All right, review. Want to go to the next slide, please? All right, so if you are a developer or a property management company or just somebody that's looking to acquire land or you simply want to figure out what is the circuit capacity or even the reserve load substation capacity look like in my specific area or my specific building, you could actually access this today, this Dr. Pep tool that we call it, and it's uh, just drpep.sce.com. And you, all you would do is go into the grids needs assessment layer, type in your address, you look for the squiggly gray lines, you click on it, you go all the way to the right, you hit GNA, assessment tool, scroll to the bottom. And what you see there, it actually gives you an estimate of the year prior, current year and three year projection of the reserve load circuit capacity and the reserve load substation capacity. So if you are looking to get an estimate of what that looks like for your particular site, highly recommend this tool. And of course you can always call me direct and I can walk this with you, you know, and myself as well. All right, Ruby, you wanna go to the next slide, please? All right, and one more. And one more. I know we're kind of all over the place. All right, so terms and conditions of the program. So charge ready transport does have very specific terms and conditions. And the majority of these are listed down here below. And if you do have an interest, I can certainly send you over all the documentation. We can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and really do a deep dive into your particular project. But the largest ones are listed here below, which I do want to cover with you. 
So it states here in line number two that within 45 days of signing the program participation agreement, you have to submit a purchase order for the vehicle and the charging equipment. Now, there's a big misconception in the marketplace where they think that you already have to have a PO up front in order to actually be an applied to charge ready transport. When in reality, you have anywhere between three to six months between the time that you apply till we actually ask you for that particular documentation. So kind of give you an idea from date of application to time that the infrastructure is in the ground for this particular program, you are looking at a year to year and a half time frame. So you definitely, once you're in that two year sweet spot of receiving your first batch of electric vehicles is when you want to make sure you engage with us so we can start the process for you with charge ready transport. Now, the third line there says that there is a signed property easement that is required. So one thing I can tell you about the easement, it is a utility access easement. We are required to do all the upgrades and any kind of repairs to that infrastructure that we install in perpetuity. So that is something where if you need a copy of that easement, I can certainly send it to you. One thing I can tell you guys, there are no red line revisions, addendums, or emails alluding to on either the program agreement or the easements themselves. Fourth line there says that you have to deploy the vehicles within 18 months of signing the program participation agreement. There is a lot of supply chain issues. We will certainly work with you in that regard if it's something where your you know, EVs are being delayed for whatever reason. Your charges do have to be installed and operational for 10 years under this particular program. So it is a question that I often get, uh, you know, what any kind of requirements as far as time frame. So yes, there is a 10 year program participation requirement. It is transferable. So if you are leasing, it would either go to the next person coming in or to the property owner, him or herself. If you are owning and you decide to sell at some later point, it would automatically transfer because there would be an easement on the property. So that's the way that reads. And any kind of future vehicle acquisition plan we do hold you to it. So let's say, for example, in the scenario that I used earlier where you're deploying 100 day caps over the next 10 years and you only end up purchasing 90, then there might be a possibility for a clawback. So these are things that we need to talk about and make sure that we actually get that number as accurate as possible up front before we do your application. All right, if you could go to the next slide, please. All right, guys, so this is our process flow. So this is the timeline of charge ready transfer. You might be wondering, why does it take a year to year and a half from date of application to the time that the infrastructure is in the ground. A lot of things could happen. I normally see where customers, they know what kind of electric vehicles they want to buy. They know where they want to place them, but they don't know what kind of charges they want to you know, purchase. And sometimes that will hold up our customers for several months. So have I seen it go faster? Yes, but I've also seen it go slower. So a couple of pitfalls to consider. If you are buying chargers, or excuse me, EVs, you do definitely want to make sure you have your charger selection picked out as soon as possible. If not, you will get stuck in step number three until you actually figure that out. We actually utilize the charger information to be able to develop our infrastructure design plan that's part of the program. So that's why it's vital, vital that we actually get that information as soon as possible. I've seen it where customers also sign their agreements and then they change the electric vehicles that they're buying or they change the charger selection or even the location at times. And that could also delay your program. Uh, if you see in step number 11 and 16, there are easements. We talked a little bit about easements. So I've seen where customers will literally go all the way up to step number 10 and they haven't sent in the documentation to legal, you know, whether it's a program agreement or the easement that could also delay your project. Now, mind you, that would be on your guys' side potentially, but it's something where we want to make sure we disclose this information to you up front. Uh, biggest thing to look at here, if you do qualify for any rebates, notice that they are after your installation is complete. So it's about a 30 to 45 day window afterwards. So these are things that you do have to know if you are going to apply to charge ready transport. All right, if you could please go to the next slide. All right, guys, I knew I'd throw a lot at you. I am always available to you. If you just want to pop open your cameras on your cell phone, scan that link icon that you see there. It's going to give you another condensed version of this presentation. I know it talks super fast, but I was only given 10 minutes. So what we could do is if you guys have any questions, any concerns, you want to discuss a project in detail, I'm always available. Hit the blue button, hit my save my information on your phone, and we'll definitely be in contact. Thank you guys once again for having me. Great. Thank you, Ramiro. Um, I actually want to go back a slide or two really quick before we jump to Tina, because I'm glad that you touched on this. And this kind of goes to your question, Daryl. Um, so if you are looking to develop a new project and you're curious about what the load is and you're working with an electrical engineer or your dry utility consultant and you're like, OK, let's get an idea of what power is available in the area. The Dr. Pep tool is a really great tool for you yourself to go on and look at to see what the available capacity is. I can't say right now it's the most up to date. Um, we do have another tool through our economic development team um, that is very similar to this and ties into the Dr. Pep, which may be a little bit more updated. 
So if you are interested in utilizing that, um, I can send you the link and I can also connect you with one of our economic development team members who can also give you a little bit more guidance on how to use the tool as well. But thank you, uh, Ramiro, for sharing this. This is, a, this is one of our really um, most advanced tools that help our customers give them direction on, on uh, designing their power. All right, so without further ado, uh, Tina with Wilden is going to cover the California Energy Design Assistance Program. So Tina, take it away. Thanks so much, Ruby Rose. Uh, good morning, everybody. I just wanted to uh, extend a nice thank you to the Los Angeles Latino Chamber of Commerce and also Southern California Edison for inviting me to participate in this commercial workshop. Uh, I'm again, Tina Hendricks from Wilden. We're the implementer of the statewide new construction program called CETA, which is the California Energy Design Assistance Program. And I'm gonna go over an overview of the program, but uh, if you have any questions or projects that you'd like to discuss, I'll have my contact information towards the end and would love to be able to help you with those. So what is CETA? CETA again is the California Energy Design Assistance Program. And what we do is we provide a complementary whole building energy analysis uh, of your project. So we can look at energy savings, we can look at the incentive that would be provided. We work within new construction or major renovation projects, major alteration projects. Uh, we serve the various sectors below. I've highlighted commercial, industrial, and agriculture just for the purposes of our webinar here today, but we also do work within public facilities, high-rise multifamily, which is four stories and above. And we service, we are actually within the service territories of PG&E, Southern California Edison, Southern California Gas, and San Diego Gas and Electric Service Territories. So if you have projects within those service territories, those would be uh, CETA potential projects. Next slide, please. So the objectives of the program, California has some very big clean energy goals and CETA is going to be a part of that. We are helping to electrify and also to help with decarbonization. Uh, and that is done again through either new construction or major renovation projects. Next slide, please, Ruby. And what would you get if you participate in CETA? So again, I mentioned the whole building energy modeling. In order of importance, in my opinion, the bullet points here. So again, that's really the key for this is taking a look at all of the different energy efficiency measures that you're considering for your project. We, looks at, we look at things like lighting, HVAC, and building envelope. We help to identify different energy savings opportunities. And we work as a collaborator with your team. We will include energy cost and paybacks. We'll also include reduction, uh, carbon reduction information. And then of course, the final piece is the, uh, in the financial incentive that would be paid to the owner. Next slide, please. So program eligibility, in order to be eligible for the CETA program, again, it has to either be a new construction project or a major alteration. I'll explain a little bit uh, more on the next few slides about the uh, what qualifies as major alteration. The real key for us is we need to be involved with the project as early as possible in the design phase. Uh, and the reason for that, we need to be able to show what's called influence over the project. We need to show the CPUC that if it were not for the, the CETA program, that perhaps these energy efficiency measures may not have been implemented in the construction of the building. Uh, and in order to do that, we have to be fairly early on in design. I'll show you a little bit of a graphic on that coming up here shortly. We will exceed the standard practice baseline code and current design. The other key for us is it has to be within the service territories, the four IOU investor owned uh, utility service territories that I mentioned. You also have to either pay or be paying what's called the PPP, the public purpose programs charge. And then the other thing on this um, is that there is no double dipping. So if you are paid for an incentive through the CETA program, you cannot be repaid for that same measure through another um, ratepayer efficiency, energy efficiency program. And in terms of major alterations, think full gut renovation. So maybe not just a lighting retrofit or a paint or carpet change out, but a full gut renovation. And then in addition to that full gut renovation, 
you also have to meet one of these bullet points. Uh, first bullet point is either a change in the space function. So say you're going from uh, manufacturing to warehousing or you're going from office space to multifamily apartments, some kind of a, a change in the space function, or a substantial change of greater than 30% in design occupancy, square feet per person, or an increase of greater than 10% in conditioned floor area. So again, not all three of these, just one of these bullet points. And then the last bullet point really refers to agricultural or industrial projects where there's an expansion or addition of substantial process or conditioning load to an existing facility. So think uh, adding a conveyor belt, a physical plant, uh, things of that nature. Next slide, please. The timing. So the, there's two graphics here. The top chart is a traditional design bid build process. And you can see under the green section up until about design development, we're good to engage with CETA. When you get to the construction documents phase, we're probably a little bit too late unless you're still open to making any changes. Uh, and then we can certainly uh, accept the, the project into the program if it meets the eligibility requirements. And then on the design bid build, we have a little bit longer time frame. However, again, if we get to the point where um, there's changes that can no longer be made, we don't have the chance to influence the project, it's going to be too late for us to help with CETA. And then we have two paths to CETA. We offer both a mixed fuel, which is gas and electric, as well as an innovative all electric option as well. Uh, next slide, please. The key to the all electric is there cannot be any gas meter at all on the site. So just wanted to kind of mention that. I'll get to the incentives here shortly, but just to say at this point that the all electric incentive is higher than the mixed fuel. Next slide, please. The process. So we've really made it a simple five-step streamlined process to enroll in CETA. A, the first step is we have a portal that you could go to and enroll any project anytime. Uh, it's CaliforniaEDA.com, which stands for Energy Design Assistance. They will ask for about 12 or so pieces of information, your name, the project name, the address. Uh, we can go back at any time and edit, add, update the information, but that will at least get the, the ball rolling and get you into the CETA program. We then need to confirm eligibility, again, that it's in the correct service territory, that it's early enough in design. Uh, also size of the project. We typically look for about 15,000 square feet on the, on the low end up to about 500,000 square feet on the high end for projects, but that is uh, flexible if you have a project that's either uh, under or above those. And that will get the ball rolling. If you enrolled a project this week, the following Monday afternoon or Tuesday morning, we actually make the assignments over to our Wildan project managers. So you would have your own dedicated project manager for the project. They'll work with you and your team. They will have two virtual meetings with you. Uh, the first meeting is a preliminary analysis meeting where they'll talk about the project, what you're trying to accomplish, more specifics about it. That takes about 60 minutes virtually. And then there will be a second meeting, which is called the final analysis meeting. And there's about a four to six week window in between the two meetings. And that allows for us to also have an, a dedicated energy modeler that will actually do the energy modeling for your building. They will present that at that second final analysis meeting. That meeting takes about 90 minutes virtually. And the reason for that extra time is that we can actually make changes on the fly in real time during that meeting of anything that's discussed or anything that needs to be changed. Uh, you're not obligated to select anything that we would energy model or bundle for you, but we will present to you on that second meeting three energy bundles, uh, call it a good, better and best scenario. Again, not obligated to select any, but let's say for discussion that you pick the middle bundle. The project gets built. Once it is built, we do have to send out one of our Wildan measurement and verification team members to verify that the energy efficiency measures were actually implemented in the construction of the building. And then the fifth step is the incentives are paid directly to the building owner. Um, Wanted to mention here, and you can skip ahead, Rue, because the next slides just go into more detail about each of the steps. But I also wanted to mention that uh, as of this two weeks ago, actually, we also now offer a $2,800 design team participation incentive 
for your design team as well. So wanted to mention that. And then the incentive summary, the real important piece of information here is the incentive rates, which you'll see on the right side of the screen in the orange box. You'll see the mixed fuel incentive rate on the top and the all electric towards the bottom. And then I'm gonna also have you go ahead and skip ahead to the next slide if you would please. And I wanna just talk a little bit about a comparison to CETA, from CETA to Savings by Design, which was a former program. So CETA has been in place just over a year. August was a year. It's a five-year program. And just to point out some of the differences, if anybody was familiar with the older Savings by Design program, CETA is the bigger, better program. And here's why. Uh, I'm going to start with the third bullet point down. We have a higher cap on incentives. We have a million dollars available per project, where Savings by Design had $150,000 per project. We utilize standard practice baseline. Savings by Design utilized California Energy Commission Title 24. We now offer complementary energy modeling throughout the four different utilities, and that varied by utility prior to this. And then we now base the incentives on the net life cycle savings over the useful life of the measure, whereas before it was just on that first year of energy savings. So it gives you a much better picture of the um, actual energy savings. So again, just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of a background between the older program and the new CETA program. Next slide. Uh, I am local. Again, my name is Tina Hendricks. If I can help you with any questions, any projects, um, more than happy to, to help. We do work with a couple of uh, subcontractors that help us with industrial and agricultural type projects. We have quite a bit that we've done in terms of indoor agriculture projects. Um, we've done a whole lot of multifamily and a lot of other projects as well, projects as well over the past year. So would be happy to, again, work with you on any of your projects and appreciate your time this morning. Thank you very much for having me. Great, thank you, Tina. Um, okay. Uh, we are down to the wire here on time, so um, I'm just going to do a really high level uh, overview of the 2022 Energy Code, specifically um, the portion that is now going to be um, and requirements that are now going to be for controlled environment, environment horticulture uh, facilities. This is something that is new within the Energy Code. Um, they have never been required necessarily to meet requirements for the energy code. They've only been uh, needing to meet requirements for the building code. So just want to make sure that anybody who is designing and or building these types of facilities um, are aware of what these requirements are. Um, there is going to be a lighting minimum efficacy requirement uh, where the PPE requirement is up to 2.1 micromoles per joule. I mean, this is technically an LED light but it's not specifically calling it out, um, but that is the requirement that you will have to meet. Uh, also time switch controls and multi-level lighting controls as well, um, and designing the electrical power system serving these types of spaces so that the lighting loads are separated from other lighting loads. So if you have your office space and then you have your grow space, you will need to make sure that those are on two um, different uh, systems. Um, and then also uh, this, this requirement is applicable to uh, new construction additions, um, any alterations that change the occupancy from being conditioned to, un uh, from unconditioned to conditioned, meaning that you're heating and cooling the space. So that's the lighting uh, requirement. Then also there's going to be the efficient uh, dehumidification. This also applies to new construction and newly installed HVAC and dehumidification systems, um, even if they are within existing facilities. Uh, this measure mandates the use of one of the following dehumidification systems, either a standalone dehumidifier, uh, which meets the energy factors as noted there, um, an integrated HVAC system with on-site heat recovery, uh, a chilled water system with an on-site heat recovery as well, or solid or liquid desiccant dehumidification system uh, for system designs that require a 50 degree Fahrenheit dew point or less. Um, also an on-site heat recovery design system or heat recovery system must be designed to fulfill at least 75% of the facility's annual reheating needs. 
and these facilities um, are exempt from the prescriptive requirement to install an air side economizer when a carbon dioxide enrichment is used as a strategy to promote plant growth. And then lastly, there are also requirements for the envelope uh, for greenhouses. Um, opaque walls and opaque roof assemblies um, must meet the minimum requirements within section 120.7 of the energy code. Um, Non-opaque wall assemblies, which could be your skylights um, and any of your glass areas must have a combined U factor of a 0 0.7, um, as well as your roof assemblies too. And then this does apply to newly constructed greenhouses. And again, those that are being converted from unconditioned to conditioned space. Um, you can uh, look up Energy Code Ace. They have an uh, exuberant amount of information on the Energy Code. And they also have another full workshop that does a deeper dive on what these updates are. So if you are interested, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or to the Latino Chamber. And we can see if we can get one of those scheduled for uh, next year.